embarking on the first chapter of our exploration into back end of the line, BEOL, interconnects promises to be as enlightening as it is exhilarating. Today, we will navigate through the intricate universe of semiconductor devices, focusing on the application of thin film technology and bail interconnects. I'm Semi Sherpa, your guide through this labyrinth of semiconductor processes. Understanding the complexities of bail interconnects is a cornerstone of semiconductor manufacturing knowledge, and unraveling its intricacies can unlock a treasure trove of innovation and understanding. Whether you're an experienced engineer, an inquisitive student, or a professional stepping into the semiconductor terrain, this exploration is designed with you in mind. In this episode, we're charting a course through key territories, including the rich history of interconnects, the art of aluminum metallization, the science behind tungsten via, and the magic of silicide technology. But that's just the beginning. In our next episode, we'll dive deeper, exploring the mysteries of electroplating technology, the wonders of copper interconnects, and the future of copper technology. So, fasten your seatbelts and get ready for a ride that's as enlightening as it is thrilling. Are you ready to dive headfirst into the world of interconnects? Let's ignite our engines and launch this adventure together. The journey of interconnection in semiconductor devices is a fascinating tale of precision, miniaturization, and ingenuity. It starts at the level of an application processor, AP, chip mounted on a printed circuit board, PCB, and dives deep into the minute world of transistors within the silicon die. The AP chip is often packaged using ball grid array, BGA, technology, which uses an array of solder balls as electrical interconnections between the chip and the PCB. These solder balls are placed on the underside of the chip package and provide a robust and reliable connection to the PCB. The PCB itself is populated with various components including the AP chip, all interconnected using conductive traces etched on the board. This arrangement provides the necessary electrical paths for signal and power transmission. Within the package, the AP chip, or die, is connected to the solder balls using a technology known as flip chip bonding. This process involves the use of micro bumps on the chip's surface, which are aligned and connected to corresponding pads on the substrate within the package. These micro bumps are typically made of solder and provide the electrical connection between the chip and the solder balls of the BGA package. This interconnection methodology allows for a high number of I.O., input slash output, connections, critical for advanced AP chips. The substrate in the package provides a level of electrical routing similar to the PCB, but on a much smaller scale. It routes the connections from the micro bumps to the corresponding solder balls, facilitating the interconnection to the PCB. The substrate can also host passive components, such as resistors and capacitors, which are integrated into the package to save space on the PCB and improve electrical performance. Inside the die, the interconnection journey continues with the back end of line, BEOL, process, which is responsible for creating the metal layers that interconnect the transistors. These metal layers serve as the wiring for the chip, providing the path for signal and power transmission between different functional blocks and transistors. The interconnect layers and the bail process are built up in a sequence of deposition, patterning, and etching steps, creating a complex three-dimensional network of wires at the nanometer scale. The transistors themselves, the heart of the AP chip, are created during the front end of line, FEOL, process. These transistors are responsible for all the digital and analog processing within the chip. They are connected to the bail interconnect layers through contacts and vias, creating a seamless electrical connection from the transistor level to the outside world. In summary, the process of semiconductor interconnection spans multiple levels of scale and complexity, from the macro scale of the PCB to the nano scale of the transistor. It serves as the physical embodiment of intellectual property, offering higher integration and lower cost, which are critical to profitability. It is designed to carry various types of signals and power, including digital I.O., analog I.O., and memory power, ensuring the smooth and efficient operation of the AP chip and the overall electronic system. The history of back-end of line, BEOL, interconnect technology is a fascinating journey of innovation and adaptation. The story begins in the 1970s, when polysilicon and aluminum were the primary materials used for interconnects. Polysilicon gates and aluminum interconnects on silicon were the norm, setting the stage for the technological advancements that were to follow. 
As we moved into the 1980s, the technology evolved further with the introduction of local planarization, aluminum alloys, and silicide contacts. Local planarization was a process that improved the flatness of the wafer surface, allowing for more precise patterning of the interconnects. Aluminum alloys were used to improve the reliability and performance of the interconnects, while silicide contacts were introduced to reduce contact resistance. The 1990s brought about even more advancements, with the advent of global planarization, self-aligned silicide, salicide, chemical vapor deposition, CVD, tungsten plugs, and low-K dielectrics. Global planarization further improved the flatness of the wafer surface, while self-aligned silicide, salicide, technology allowed for the formation of silicide on the source-slash-drain regions of the transistor, reducing contact resistance. CVD tungsten plugs were used to fill vias and contact holes, and low-K dielectrics were introduced to reduce capacitive coupling between interconnect lines. In the recent years, the transition to contact silicide, copper and low-K dielectrics has been a major shift in bale interconnect technology. However, it's important to note that the recent technology of contact silicide is a different evolution from the self-aligned silicide, salicide, technology. Contact silicide technology selectively forms silicide only at the bottom area of the contact, unlike salicide technology which forms silicide over the entire source-slash-drain region. Copper has lower resistivity than aluminum, allowing for faster signal propagation and lower power consumption. Low-K dielectrics further reduce capacitive coupling, improving performance and reducing power consumption. As we venture into the future and grapple with the challenges of 10 nanometers technology and beyond, the escalating resistance in copper interconnects due to electron scattering becomes a significant hurdle. This has prompted the exploration of materials with a long electron mean free path. Already, new materials such as molybdenum, ruthenium, and cobalt have been adopted as alternatives to copper for local interconnects. These promising materials hold the potential to mitigate the resistance increase issue, thereby sustaining the trajectory of performance enhancement in semiconductor devices. The metal-thin films used in bale interconnects require a diverse range of properties. Firstly, one of the key characteristics required is low resistivity. This involves minimizing three primary factors that obstruct electron flow, phonon scattering, grain boundary scattering, and surface scattering. Phonon scattering can be reduced by increasing grain size to minimize defects, while grain boundary scattering can be minimized by reducing the surface area of grain boundaries. Surface scattering, which occurs at the interface and surface of the metal film, can be reduced by lowering the roughness of these surfaces. Thermal stability is another critical characteristic for metal films in bale interconnect technology. As these films are subjected to various temperatures during the fabrication process, it's crucial for the materials to maintain their structural integrity and resistivity even under thermal stress. Electromigration, EM, and stress migration, SM, stability are also critical factors for bale interconnects. EM refers to the displacement of metal atoms due to the momentum transfer from the electrons moving through the metal. SM, on the other hand, refers to the movement of atoms within the metal driven by mechanical stress. Both these effects can degrade the performance and reliability of the metal interconnects. Contamination spread within the device or equipment is another critical aspect to consider. Depending on whether the contaminant is a non-metal, metal, ruthenium, IU, or copper, CU, it needs to be managed appropriately within the fab, front opening unified pod, FOUP, equipment, and processes. The ability to undergo chemical vapor deposition, CVD, atomic layer deposition, ALD, and chemical mechanical polishing, CMP, are other key characteristics. These processes allow for the creation of 3D structures, which are increasingly important as devices continue to scale down. Compatibility with surrounding processes, such as etching and SMP, is also crucial. This includes maintaining corrosion stability, which ensures the long-term reliability of the interconnects. Adhesion to the underlying or adjacent layers is another key attribute of metal films in bale interconnects. Good adhesion helps ensure the integrity of the multi-layer structure, reducing the likelihood of delamination or other reliability issues. Low stress is also required in the metal films to prevent structural deformations that could negatively impact the device performance. The metal films should also be capable of being deposited at low temperatures, which is essential for compatibility with temperature-sensitive materials and processes in the device. 
Finally, high productivity and easy thickness control are also important characteristics. This ensures that the manufacturing process can be conducted efficiently and that the characteristics of the metal films can be precisely controlled to meet the design requirements. In the 1970s, polysilicon and aluminum were the primary materials employed for interconnects on silicon. Both aluminum and silicon are solid substances at room temperature and exhibit negligible solid solubility. However, during the high temperature conditions of semiconductor manufacturing, these materials can interact, leading to a phenomenon known as aluminum junction spiking. Aluminum junction spiking is a phenomenon that occurs during the heat treatment processes in semiconductor fabrication, particularly when aluminum is used as the interconnect material. The issue arises due to the interaction between aluminum and silicon at the aluminum-silicon junction. At temperatures around 450 degrees Celsius, which are common during semiconductor processing, the solid solubility of silicon in aluminum increases up to about half a percent. This means that more silicon atoms can be accommodated within the aluminum lattice. The silicon atoms can then diffuse into the aluminum interconnect, driven by the concentration gradient between the silicon substrate and the aluminum interconnect. As the silicon atoms diffuse into the aluminum, they can form a compound known as aluminum silicide. This compound has a lower melting point than pure aluminum or silicon, and it can form spikes that extend into the silicon substrate. These spikes are essentially regions where the aluminum silicide has diffused into the silicon, disrupting the uniformity of the silicon substrate. When the temperature is subsequently reduced after the heat treatment process, these spikes of aluminum silicide remain embedded in the silicon. They form a conductive path that can lead to short circuits and device failures. So, in essence, aluminum junction spiking is a result of the diffusion of silicon into aluminum at high temperatures, leading to the formation of aluminum silicide and the creation of conductive spikes. This can occur even in the solid state, without the need for a liquid phase. Several solutions have been proposed to mitigate this problem. One of the early solutions involved using a silicon-doped aluminum material instead of pure aluminum metal. However, this approach is no longer in widespread use due to various issues like increased resistance, silicon precipitation and segregation of excess silicon. A more effective solution involves the introduction of a diffusion barrier, typically composed of titanium nitride, TIN, along with a titanium glue layer. The titanium nitride layer serves as a barrier to prevent aluminum from diffusing into the silicon substrate, while the titanium layer forms titanium silicide, TISI2, which promotes good contact and adhesion. This solution has proven to be quite effective in preventing aluminum junction spiking. Another promising approach involves changing the material structure from silicon slash aluminum to silicon slash silicide slash barrier metal slash tungsten. This configuration has shown promise in mitigating the junction spiking issue, thanks to the different diffusion characteristics of silicide compared to silicon. In conclusion, while aluminum junction spiking presents a significant challenge in bale interconnect processes in 1970s, various strategies, including the use of diffusion barriers and material structure changes, have been developed to address this problem. In the back end of line, EEOL, processes of semiconductor manufacturing, aluminum has been a key material in interconnect technology due to its excellent electrical conductivity and ease of integration. However, aluminum interconnects are subjected to a critical reliability issue known as electromigration, which is essentially the displacement of aluminum atoms under the influence of an electric field. Electromigration is driven by the momentum transferred from conducting electrons to the aluminum atoms during device operation under high current densities. The aluminum atoms tend to migrate in the direction of electron flow, causing significant microstructural alterations in the interconnect. This migration of atoms creates areas of compressive and tensile stress within the metal interconnect, leading to the formation of voids and hillux, which can ultimately cause failure of the IC. One of the defining factors influencing the rate and extent of electromigration in aluminum interconnects is the microstructural attributes of the aluminum film. Specifically, the grain boundaries within the interconnects metal structure play a significant role. Grain boundaries, being areas of high energy and high diffusivity, serve as preferential paths for the migration of aluminum atoms. Thus, they are often referred to as the hotspots for electromigration. At these grain boundaries, the aluminum atoms can migrate more easily compared to the bulk of the metal, leading to the formation of voids or empty spaces in these regions. Conversely, areas where aluminum atoms accumulate may form hillocks, which are protrusions in the interconnect structure. Both these structural anomalies, voids and hillocks, can detrimentally impact the electrical performance of the interconnect, thereby threatening the overall reliability of the device. 
while the interfaces between aluminum and other materials, such as silicon dioxide, SiO2, can also influence electromigration, they are generally less susceptible than grain boundaries. This is primarily because the formation of a native aluminum oxide, allox, layer at these interfaces can serve as a diffusion barrier, which hinders the movement of aluminum atoms. In conclusion, electromigration in aluminum interconnects, with a distinct emphasis on the role of grain boundaries as hotspots, presents a significant reliability challenge in bale processes of semiconductor manufacturing. The phenomenon is induced by the movement of aluminum atoms under high current densities, with the process significantly dictated by factors like temperature, current density, and most notably, the microstructure of the interconnect. The resulting structural changes can potentially lead to device failure, emphasizing the importance of mitigating electromigration in aluminum interconnects. In semiconductor device operation, electromigration represents a significant challenge, especially for metal interconnects like aluminum. Various strategies have been adopted to mitigate the effects of electromigration in aluminum interconnects. Firstly, one strategy is the addition of copper, Cu, to the aluminum. Copper acts as a diffusion barrier, preventing the motion of aluminum atoms under electron wind force, thereby increasing electromigration resistance. Secondly, reducing the length of the interconnect wires can also be beneficial as it decreases the path length for electromigration. Moreover, the application of a shunt layer, typically composed of tungsten, W, or titanium nitride, TIN, can provide an alternate path for the current, relieving the electromigration stress on the aluminum. Thirdly, aluminum annealing is another effective method used to improve electromigration resistance. This thermal process increases the grain size of the aluminum, reducing the number of grain boundaries, and can result in a bamboo-like structure where grain boundaries are perpendicular to the current flow. With fewer transverse grain boundaries, there are fewer paths for electromigration, enhancing the electromigration resistance of the aluminum. Lastly, the orientation or texture of the metal layers can also influence electromigration. For example, ATI-002, TIN-111, stack enhances the uniformity of the grains, which can further reduce the susceptibility of the aluminum to electromigration. L11. To summarize, aluminum electromigration, driven by high current densities, predominantly occurs at grain boundaries due to their atomic disorder. However, through techniques like copper doping, wire length reduction, shunt layer application, aluminum annealing, and grain texture control, the impact of this phenomenon can be substantially reduced, improving the performance and reliability of semiconductor devices. Physical vapor deposition PVD, of titanium nitride, TIN, on aluminum metal is a critical process in the back end of line, BEOL, interconnects in semiconductor manufacturing. Titanium nitride serves as an anti-reflective coating, RC, on aluminum metal layers, which is vital for the photolithography process. Photolithography is a process used to transfer patterns onto a semiconductor wafer. It involves exposing a photosensitive material, known as photoresist, to light through a photomask. The light exposure causes chemical changes in the photoresist, allowing the desired pattern to be etched onto the wafer. However, if the underlying layer is highly reflective, like aluminum, the reflected light can cause the photoresist to be unintentionally exposed, leading to pattern anomalies. Aluminum metal has a high reflectivity, with a reflectance of 215% when compared to bare silicon, which is considered to have a reflectance of 100%. This high reflectance can cause issues during photolithography, as the reflected light can interfere with the patterning process. This is where the role of PVD TIN as an ARC becomes crucial. The TIN layer, deposited on top of the aluminum metal, absorbs the incident light, reducing its reflection. After the deposition of the ARC TIN, the reflectance can be reduced to 37%, significantly improving the photolithography process by preventing unintended exposure of the photoresist, ensuring accurate pattern transfer. The PVD TIN layer is deposited using a reactive sputtering process. In this process, a titanium target is bombarded with ions, causing titanium atoms to be ejected from the target. These atoms then react with nitrogen in the chamber to form TIN, which gets deposited on the wafer. The thickness of the TIN layer is a critical factor in its effectiveness as an ARC. The thickness needs to be optimized to achieve the maximum anti-reflective effect. Too thin, and it may not adequately absorb the incident light, too thick, and it may introduce additional stress into the film, potentially leading to defects. In addition to its role as an ARC, the PVD TIN layer also serves other functions. It can act as a barrier layer, preventing the diffusion of aluminum into the dielectric layer. It also helps to alleviate stress migration, 
a phenomenon where mechanical stress can cause atoms to migrate, leading to voids or hillocks in the metal layer. In the realm of back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, the use of aluminum has been a common choice in the past, but it comes with its set of challenges. One such significant challenge is the occurrence of the seagull defects, named so because of their unique shape resembling that of a seagull. The seagull defect is a phenomenon that often arises during the aluminum etch scheme using a photoresist, PR, mask. The etching process can lead to the formation of aluminum oxide on the surface, especially during photo rework. This aluminum oxide can create a bottom bridge after etching, leading to what we refer to as the seagull defect. The key contributing factor to this defect is the grain boundary oxidation that results in the characteristic seagull shape. Interestingly, these defects are quite tricky to spot from the top, primarily because they form a bottom bridge. This makes it difficult to detect and address them promptly, leading to potential issues in the overall circuit performance. The industry has been exploring ways to mitigate this issue. One approach is to limit the number of reworks, which can reduce the chances of seagull defect formation. Another promising solution is the implementation of a hard mask etch scheme, consisting of chemical vapor deposition, CVD, oxide and titanium nitride. Utilizing ATIN hard mask could substantially lower the risk of aluminum oxidation, thereby reducing the occurrence of seagull defects. However, it's important to remember that these approaches might bring their own set of trade-offs. For instance, limiting rework might impact the overall flexibility and adaptability of the fabrication process. Similarly, the introduction of a new etch scheme with TIN hard masks would necessitate a thorough understanding of the interaction of TIN with other materials in the bale interconnect and potential adjustments in the fabrication process. In the back end of line VEOL, interconnect processes, the physical vapor deposition, PVD, of aluminum, L, has been traditionally used to fill vias or contact holes connecting different metal layers. While the PVD method has its advantages, such as simplicity and cost-effectiveness, it has significant limitations when it comes to filling narrow or high aspect ratio contact holes. The PVD process involves depositing aluminum atoms onto the wafer surface, where they condense and form a film. However, as device geometries have shrunk over the years, the aspect ratios, the ratio of the height to the width, of the contact holes have increased. This means the holes have become deeper while remaining narrow. In such scenarios, the aluminum atoms find it challenging to conformally coat the inside of these high aspect ratio structures due to line of sight restrictions inherent in the PVD process. As a result, voids or empty spaces can form within the contact holes, particularly in cases of narrow tapered contact holes. These voids can lead to increased resistance or even open circuits, severely impacting the device performance. To improve the fill quality, techniques such as hot aluminum deposition or aluminum reflow have been used. Hot aluminum deposition involves depositing aluminum at elevated substrate temperatures to enhance the mobility of aluminum atoms, encouraging a more conformal deposition. Similarly, aluminum reflow is a post-deposition annealing process that allows the aluminum to rearrange and fill in any pre-existing voids. However, these techniques offer limited improvement and are not fully effective at eliminating voids in high aspect ratio contact holes. In response to these challenges, the industry has been moving towards the use of chemical vapor deposition, CVD, of tungsten, W, for plug fill. CVD is a process that allows for a more conformal deposition of metals, making it better suited for filling high aspect ratio structures. With CVD tungsten plug process, it's possible to achieve void free fill in contact holes, enhancing the reliability and performance of the interconnects. In the semiconductor fabrication process, the formation of tungsten vias is a critical step in back end of line, BEOL, interconnects. This process begins with depositing a thick blanket oxide film on a planar surface. This film is typically deposited using plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, PECVD, with a tetraethyl orthosilicate, TEOS, precursor, at a temperature ranging from 350 to 400 degrees Celsius. After this deposition, the oxide interlayer dielectric, ILD, is patterned using a photoresist and etched to expose the underlying metal layer or the contact level silicide. Once the resist is stripped off, the via opening is cleaned and then lined with a thin titanium, TI, layer by picade with TiCl4 precursor and H2 plasma. The titanium layer serves two important functions, it acts as an adhesion layer and it decreases the contact resistance to underlying conductors by reducing interfacial oxides. 
Following the deposition of the titanium layer, titanium nitride TIN, is deposited in situ by chemical vapor deposition CVD, using TiCl4 precursor and NH3 reactants. The process then proceeds to fill the remainder of the hole in a conformal, void-free manner with CVD tungsten at a temperature of 425 to 450 degrees Celsius, through the psi 4 reduction of WF6. The titanium nitride barrier layer plays a crucial role here, as it protects the CVD byproducts from attacking the underlying titanium adhesion layer and oxide. After this, the excess tungsten, titanium nitride, and titanium in the field regions are finally removed through the process of chemical mechanical polishing, CMP, resulting in a top of the tungsten via that is coplanar with the flat oxide surface. This method of embedding metal structures in dielectrics is known as the Damascene process, paying homage to an ancient art originating from Damascus, where soft metals like gold would be inlaid into precious stones. The tungsten via technology has matured significantly, now regularly forming void-free and untapered vias with aggressive aspect ratios exceeding 3 to 1, thus enabling increases in wiring density and reduction of capacitive parasitics to under and overlying wires. The Buell, back end of line, process in semiconductor manufacturing involves the creation of metal interconnects that link individual devices, such as transistors, on the chip. This process is vital for the functioning of integrated circuits and impacts the performance, power consumption, and scaling potential of devices. One critical aspect of the Buell process is the filling of vias and contacts with metal to create these interconnects. Chemical vapor deposition, CVD, of tungsten is a common method for this task, especially in advanced technology nodes where the aspect ratios of the structures can be very high. In the CVD tungsten process, tungsten hexafluoride, WF6, is used as the precursor gas. WF6 is a volatile, fluorine compound of tungsten which is a critical component in the formation of the tungsten film. It reacts with hydrogen, H2, gas at high temperatures to deposit pure tungsten on the substrate surface. The CVD tungsten process can be divided into two main steps, the nucleation or seed layer formation, and the bulk layer deposition. The nucleation layer is crucial as it forms the foundation for the subsequent tungsten deposition. It is commonly achieved by a pulsing process, which involves alternating exposure of the substrate to WF6 and reducing agents such as silane, SiH4, or diborane, B2H6. Pulsing with SiH4 or B2H6 is done to promote the formation of a smooth and continuous tungsten film. The nucleation process is done on the first pedestal, or station, of a multi-station tool, also referred to as a merry-go-round, MGR, type tool. Here, the wafer is preheated and then exposed to a single pulse of B2H6WF6, followed by five pulses of SiH4WF6. This specific sequence is designed to facilitate the growth of a uniform tungsten seed layer. Once the seed layer is established, the wafer moves to the second pedestal for the cooling process, and then to the third and fourth pedestals for the bulk layer deposition. The bulk layer is deposited by exposure to WF6 and H2 gas. This process is repeated until a sufficient amount of tungsten is deposited. One of the key aspects of the CVD tungsten process is the creation of void-free fills. Voids can lead to high resistance or even open circuits, which can significantly impact device performance. Thus, achieving a void-free fill is a critical aspect of process control in CVD tungsten deposition. In summary, the CVD tungsten process is a critical part of the Buell interconnect formation, and proper control of the process parameters and sequence can lead to high-quality, void-free tungsten fills, which are essential for device performance and reliability. The implementation of exclusion ring technology in the chemical vapor deposition, CVD, tungsten process is a significant breakthrough. This method is designed to maintain high film uniformity while preventing tungsten deposition on the wafer edge, which can lead to contamination. This is especially crucial in etch back and chemical mechanical polishing, CMP, processes, with CMP necessitating a deposition free of bevel and edge. In the CVD process, tungsten is applied as a planar film to the wafer. It is then selectively removed from the surface, leaving behind tungsten plugs. This process is vital in semiconductor device manufacturing. Tungsten, with its excellent step coverage and superior electromigration properties, is used to fill high aspect ratio contacts and vias in logic and memory devices. 
The inherent low resistivity of tungsten has also led to the emergence of new applications, including advanced memory devices where both bit and word lines are composed of tungsten. The CMP tungsten process is developed and used to remove excess tungsten materials on the surface, excluding the contact area. Unlike the plasma etchback approach, the CMP process allows for uniform control of the area undergoing tungsten removal while minimizing plug erosion and ensuring device reliability. Consequently, CMP has become the preferred method for removing this metal. However, the removal performance of tungsten materials in the bevel region is less effective than the dry etch method, potentially causing remaining tungsten residue and particle issues. Therefore, it is necessary to protect the deposition on the bevel region during the tungsten CVD process. The exclusion ring technique contributes to the uniformity of other critical film properties that are dependent on WF6 flow, such as step coverage, ensuring successful protection of deposition on the bevel region. The gas exiting the ring entrains the WF6 from the shower head and draws it to the wafer edge, increasing the deposition rate in this area and enabling the deposition of film with the required thickness. This method provides a nominal tungsten film thickness of over 90% at 3 mm from the wafer edge and maintains the desired tungsten edge profile during wafer production. The system-to-system -system and chamber-to-chamber -chamber repeatability of the exclusion ring system is also demonstrated. In the chemical vapor deposition, CVD, tungsten process, a prevalent issue is the emergence of volcano defects. These defects, typically found post-tungsten contact formation, pose significant challenges. They extend the duration of tungsten chemical mechanical polishing, CMP, generate dark voltage contrast defects under E-beam inspection, and critically impair product yield. Volcano defects earn their name from their distinctive shape, mirroring a miniature volcano. They materialize when the WF6 precursor, used for tungsten deposition, reacts with the underlying titanium, TI, of the barrier stack. This reaction can result in the creation of titanium fluoride, a gaseous byproduct. The volatility of this byproduct can disrupt the overlying titanium nitride and tungsten layer, leading to an eruptive formation of volcano defects in the deposited tungsten film. Several strategies can be employed to curb the occurrence of volcano defects. One such approach involves the use of atomic layer deposition, ALD, titanium nitride, TIN, and fine-tuning the position of the contact liner anneal. By optimizing these parameters, the incidence of volcano defects can be reduced, thereby enhancing yield. Moreover, the application of a two-step TIN barrier and evolving simulation can enhance step coverage and contact resistance. This method can push the limits of PVD-WCVD-based metallization in integrated circuits, ICs, fabrication, consequently diminishing the likelihood of volcano defect formation. The seam suppressed tungsten, SSW, chemical vapor deposition, CVD, process is a specialized technology used in the semiconductor industry, specifically in the Centura I Sprint SSW ALD CVD process. This process is unique in that it achieves a bottom up CVD tungsten gap fill, free of voids and seams, through a distinctive selective suppression mechanism. This mechanism optimizes the volume of tungsten, creating more robust features, and helps to improve yield. In the SSW CVD process, nitrogen, N2, plasma treatment is applied during the tungsten deposition process. This treatment is selectively applied to the field areas, not the contact areas. As a result, the contact areas remain untreated by N2, allowing for selective deposition within the contacts. This selective deposition is a crucial aspect of the SSW process as it ensures that tungsten is deposited where it is needed most, improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the process. Tungsten, due to its low resistivity and minimal electromigration, has been widely used in logic and memory devices for filling contacts and middle of line, lowest level, interconnects that link transistors to the rest of the integrated circuit. However, as technology advances and dimensions shrink, it becomes increasingly challenging to ensure complete and seamless tungsten fill of these features using traditional methods. The Centura I Sprint ALD-CVD SSW system leverages applied materials long-standing expertise in materials engineering and metal CVD for contact applications. It employs a unique, selective suppression mechanism that results in a bottom-up fill free of seams or voids. This improved integrity of the fill helps increase the volume of tungsten, potentially lowering resistance, and creates more robust features. 
It also relaxes requirements on the dielectric and etch open steps, thus delivering performance, device design, and yield benefits. The SSW process is designed to suppress the formation of seams during the deposition of tungsten. This is achieved by pre-treating the nucleation layer to create preferred tungsten growth from the bottom of the structure upwards and less on the field. This minimizes the likelihood of void creating pinch off and seams, leading to a more reliable and efficient process. Barrier metals, typically composed of titanium, TI, and titanium nitride, TIN, play a crucial role in the Buell process. They are used to line the trenches and vias before the deposition of the tungsten metal. The barrier metal layer, composed of TI and TIN, serves multiple functions. The TI layer acts as an oxygen scavenger, reducing contact resistance and facilitating the formation of a TISI2 layer with the silicon sublayer. This reduction in contact resistance is crucial for the efficient transmission of electrical signals between metal layers in the interconnect structure. On the other hand, the TIN layer acts as a barrier to prevent the penetration of aluminum, AL, into silicon and the infiltration of WF6 into the SiO2 interlayer dielectric, ILD. This is critical in maintaining the integrity of the ILD, which is essential for the isolation of the metal layers and the interconnect structure. In summary, the barrier metal layer in Buell Interconnect technology is a critical component that serves multiple functions, from acting as a diffusion barrier to reducing contact resistance and protecting the dielectric material. Its role is fundamental to the successful operation of the semiconductor device. The CVD-TIN process involves the reaction of titanium tetrachloride, TiCl4, and ammonia, NH3, resulting in the formation of TIN. This process is known for its self-cleaning effects, attributed to the etching capability of SiO2 by TiCl4. CVD-TIN provides superior step coverage compared to physical vapor deposition, PVD, making it a preferred choice for high aspect ratio device features. The process of creating TIN films is typically conducted at an approximate temperature of 500 C. This involves a chemical reaction between titanium tetrachloride, TiCl4, and ammonia, NH3, resulting in the formation of titanium nitride, TIN, and hydrochloric acid, HCl, as a byproduct. Notably, this reaction can lead to the undesirable formation of white ammonium chloride, NH4Cl, powder within the pumping line. One of the significant advantages of the CVD process is its ability to create a diffusion barrier film with conformal step coverage and low electrical resistance. This is particularly beneficial in the context of Buell interconnects, where the barrier metal layers, typically titanium and titanium nitride, are crucial. These layers prevent silicon dioxide from being attacked by tungsten hexafluoride during the CVD process. However, CVD TIN films contain a high level of chlorine impurities. These impurities can induce intrinsic stress in the film, leading to film cracking defects, which can potentially translate into ILD cracks during subsequent tungsten CMP processes. To mitigate these issues, process optimization to reduce chlorine content or limiting the use to a certain film thickness and below are among the possible solutions. The MOCVD-TIN barrier metal process is a critical part of the Buell, back end of line, interconnect technology, which is used in the fabrication of semiconductor devices. This process involves the deposition of titanium nitride, TIN, multilayers, which serve as a barrier metal. The deposition of tin is performed using a chemical vapor deposition, CVD, technique, specifically metal organic chemical vapor deposition, MOCVD, using tetrachus dimethylamino titanium, TD mat, and ammonia, NH3, as precursors. The reaction between TD mat and NH3 results in the formation of TIN. Following the deposition process, the TIN layer undergoes a plasma treatment using a mixture of nitrogen, N2, and hydrogen, H2. This treatment is performed at approximately 405 C and is repeated after every 50 angstrom thick TIN layer is deposited. The purpose of this treatment is to densify the TIN layers, improving their physical and electrical properties. However, this process often results in poor sidewall film quality, which can be a challenge in the fabrication process. The processes of contact precleaning and titanium TI, deposition are also critical in this context. These steps are particularly important due to the lack of self-cleaning effects from TD mat, unlike the self-cleaning properties exhibited by titanium tetrachloride TiCl4. 
The absence of self-cleaning effects means that any native oxide or contamination present on the sublayer surface can potentially impact the contact resistance and, consequently, the performance of the device. The reactive pre-clean, RPC, process is typically used for barrier metal or tungsten contact on tungsten, aluminum, and copper. This process is facilitated by an applied materials active reactive pre-clean system. The RPC process primarily involves a physical cleaning mechanism, which is dominant in this context. The cleaning process is driven by a direct plasma, specifically an inductively coupled plasma, ICP, type. The gas mixture used in the RPC process typically consists of hydrogen and helium or hydrogen and nitrogen, which aids in the reduction of copper. A typical gas mixture would contain around 4% hydrogen, which is a general gas, while a non-flammable gas mixture would contain around 5% hydrogen. The reactions involved in the RPC process are exothermic, meaning they release heat. For instance, Cu2O reacts with H2 to produce 2Cu and H2O, and Cu reacts with H2 to produce Cu and H2O. On the other hand, the active pre-clean, a PC, process is used for barrier metal or copper contact on copper. This process is facilitated by an applied materials active active pre-clean system. Unlike the RPC process, the APC process is dominated by a chemical cleaning mechanism. The cleaning process in APC is driven by a remote plasma. The gas mixture used in the APC process is similar to that used in the RPC process, consisting of hydrogen and helium or hydrogen and nitrogen, which aids in the reduction of copper. However, the APC process is typically conducted at a temperature of around 300 degrees Celsius. Both the RPC and APC processes are crucial in the CVD tungsten plug process and Buell interconnects as they ensure the effective cleaning of the contact surfaces, thereby enhancing the overall performance and reliability of the interconnects. In the realm of semiconductor manufacturing, the back end of line, BEOL, interconnect process is crucial for the integration of various components on a chip. One of the key steps in this process is the formation of tungsten, W, plugs using chemical vapor deposition, CVD. The CVD tungsten plug process is a technique used to deposit tungsten into high aspect ratio features, such as vias and trenches, on the wafer surface. This process is essential for creating reliable electrical connections between different layers of the integrated circuit. The CCONI process, on the other hand, is a pre-cleaning process that prepares the silicon, SI, surface for subsequent processes such as silicide formation, barrier metal deposition, and tungsten deposition. The goal of this process is to remove the silicon dioxide, SiO2, layer from the silicon surface. This is important because the presence of SiO2 can interfere with the formation of a good quality silicide layer and can also lead to an increase in contact resistance. The CCONI process involves the use of ammonia, NH3, and hydrogen fluoride, HF, gases, which are subjected to remote plasma treatment to generate ammonium fluoride, NH4F. This compound then reacts with SiO2 to form a salt, ammonium hexafluorosilicate, NH42SIF6. This salt is then sublimated at temperatures above 180 degrees Celsius, effectively removing the SiO2 layer from the silicon surface. One of the challenges of this process is that it can lead to an enlargement of the critical dimension, CD, as the etching process can remove not only the SiO2 sublayer but also the interlayer dielectric, ILD, SiO2 used in the process. However, the benefits of this process, such as the ability to proceed with subsequent processes like silicide and barrier metal deposition without interruption, often outweigh these challenges. Now, let's delve into the role of silicides in the Buell, back end of line, interconnect process. The Buell interconnect process is a critical stage in semiconductor manufacturing where the active devices, transistors, are interconnected with wiring on the wafer. This process involves the deposition and patterning of metal layers and insulating dielectrics, which are then interconnected through vias and trenches. Silicides play a pivotal role in this process due to their unique properties. They are compounds made up of silicon and a metal and they are primarily used in the semiconductor industry to form a low-resistance contact between the transistor and the first layer of metal interconnects. This is crucial because high contact resistance can lead to significant power loss and reduced performance of the device. The formation of silicides, such as titanium silicide, TISI2, or cobalt silicide, COSI2, 
is achieved through a process known as solicitation. In this process, a thin layer of metal is deposited over the silicon substrate, followed by annealing. The high temperature of the annealing process causes the metal and silicon to react, forming a layer of silicide. This silicide layer is advantageous because it has a much lower resistivity than silicon, which helps to reduce contact resistance and improve overall device performance. Furthermore, silicides are beneficial in the Buell interconnect process because they can withstand the high temperatures involved in semiconductor processing. They are thermally stable, which means they can endure the heat of subsequent processing steps without degrading or losing their beneficial properties. In the context of NMOS and PMOS transistors, silicides are used to form the source and drain contacts. The use of silicides helps to lower the Schottky barrier height, which is the energy barrier for electron transport from the metal to the silicon. By reducing this barrier, the current flow is improved, leading to better performance of the transistor. In summary, the use of silicides in the Buell interconnect process is essential for reducing contact resistance, improving device performance, and ensuring thermal stability during the high temperature processing steps. Their role in forming low resistance contacts and reducing the Schottky barrier height in NMOS and PMOS transistors further underscores their importance in semiconductor manufacturing. In the landscape of Buell, back end of line, interconnect technology, understanding the concept of contact resistivity, especially within the context of Schottky contacts, is of paramount importance. A Schottky contact, named after the German physicist Walter H. Schottky, is a specific type of metal semiconductor junction where contact resistance becomes a vital factor in determining the device's overall performance. In the context of Buell interconnect technology, the goal is often to create an ohmic contact rather than a Schottky contact to form a low resistance contact between the transistor and the first layer of metal interconnects. This is crucial because high contact resistance can lead to significant power loss and reduced performance of the device. An ohmic contact is a type of contact where the current voltage relationship is linear, meaning that the current through the contact is directly proportional to the applied voltage. This is in contrast to a Schottky contact, where the current voltage relationship is nonlinear. The conduction mechanism in a Schottky contact can be categorized into three distinct regimes depending on the doping level. These are field emission or tunneling, thermionic field emission, and thermionic emission. Field emission occurs at high doping levels and involves conduction through the narrow barrier by quantum mechanical tunneling. Thermionic field emission, on the other hand, occurs at intermediate doping levels and involves a combination of thermionic emission and tunneling. Lastly, thermionic emission, which is the predominant process at low doping levels, involves thermal excitation of electrons over the barrier. To transform a Schottky contact into an ohmic contact, heavy doping and a low barrier height are typically employed. The heavy doping increases the number of charge carriers, while the low barrier height allows these carriers to easily move across the interface. This combination can effectively reduce the contact resistivity, leading to the desired ohmic behavior. In the case of heavy doping, the conduction mechanism is predominantly thermionic emission, which is conducive to achieving ohmic contact. In summary, the contact resistivity in a Schottky contact is a critical parameter in Buell interconnect technology. By manipulating factors such as doping level and barrier height, and understanding the different conduction mechanisms at play, it is possible to control the contact resistivity and achieve the desired electrical properties for the device. Silicide is used in semiconductor devices to reduce the resistance at the metal semiconductor interface, specifically at the source and drain regions of a transistor. This is crucial as it directly impacts the series resistance of the transistor, and thus its overall performance. In the early stages of transistor development, a self-aligned solicitation, solicitation, scheme was commonly used. This process involves depositing a layer of metal, such as titanium, cobalt, or nickel, over the entire wafer, including over the source, drain, and gate regions of the transistors. The wafer is then annealed, causing the metal to react with the underlying silicon in the source and drain regions to form a silicide. The unreacted metal is then removed, leaving behind silicide only in the desired areas. This process is termed self-aligned because the silicide formation is automatically aligned with the source and drain regions due to the selective reaction. However, as transistor dimensions continued to scale down, challenges associated with the solicitation process began to emerge. One of the main issues is the so-called short-channel effects, which can degrade device performance. These effects become more pronounced as the length of the transistor channel decreases, which is a common trend in transistor scaling. To mitigate these issues, the industry transitioned to a contact solicitation scheme, also known as elevated source-slash-drain or ultra-shallow junction scheme. 
In this process, the source and drain regions are raised above the substrate surface, and the silicide is formed only on these elevated regions. This approach helps to reduce the contact resistance further and improve the short channel behavior, making it more suitable for scaled devices. Firstly, the elevated source slash drain structure was introduced to mitigate these issues. In this structure, the source and drain regions are raised above the substrate level, allowing for a larger silicide contact area without increasing the junction depth. This design effectively reduces the series resistance and enhances the drive current, improving overall device performance. Secondly, the continuous scaling of transistor dimensions necessitates the reduction of junction depth, leading to the development of ultra-shallow junctions. However, conventional solicitation processes pose challenges in these scenarios due to the risk of silicide encroachment, which can degrade device performance. In summary, the transition from solicitation to contact solicitation in Buell Interconnex is driven by the need to accommodate device scaling, reduce contact resistivity, improve device performance, and simplify the fabrication process. Silicides, particularly titanium disilicide, TISI2, cobalt disilicide, COSI2, and nickel silicide, NISI, are fundamental to the formation of silicon contacts in back end of line, BEOL, interconnect technology. They are valued for their ability to reduce residual oxides on silicon, which results in spatially uniform electrical properties in the contact area. Additionally, they form distinct intermetallic phases that bind metallic components into thermally stable compounds, thereby preventing junction poisoning from metal diffusion. Furthermore, they serve as a superior conductor compared to doped crystalline silicon or polycrystalline silicon. The formation of these silicides is categorized into two groups based on the dominant diffusion mechanism, metal diffusion or silicon diffusion. This distinction is crucial as it influences the specifics of the process, such as the need to avoid encroachment. In the context of silicide formation, the diffusion mechanism is temperature dependent. At lower temperatures, metal atoms are the primary diffusers. They move towards the metal to silicon reaction interface, leading to the growth of the silicide layer. This is because, at these temperatures, metal atoms have higher mobility than silicon atoms due to their location in the deposited metal layer, which is less dense and structured compared to the silicon substrate. On the other hand, at higher temperatures, silicon atoms become the primary diffusers. They move towards the metal slash silicon reaction interface, which is now located in the already formed silicide layer. This shift in the dominant diffuser is due to the increased thermal energy at higher temperatures, which allows silicon atoms in the dense and structured silicon substrate to overcome the energy barrier for diffusion. This temperature-dependent shift in the dominant diffusion species is a critical aspect of silicide formation. It influences the process parameters and conditions, such as temperature and time, to ensure the formation of a high-quality silicide layer with desired properties and minimal defects, such as encroachment. A two-step rapid thermal process, RTP, is employed to prevent the formation of a bridge between the gate and source slash drain during self-aligned solicitation. If a single high-temperature solicitation step were used, silicon would diffuse, and silicide could form along the gate spacer. Moreover, if the temperature exceeds 700 degrees Celsius, titanium can react with the sidewall spacer oxide, leading to undesirable outcomes. Therefore, the two-step RTP is a strategic approach to control the solicitation process, ensuring optimal device performance. Titanium silicide, cobalt silicide, and nickel silicide have been extensively investigated for CMOS applications. 1. Titanium disilicide, TISI2. This silicide has been widely used due to its low resistivity and ease of formation. However, it has a narrow line width effect and is limited to line widths greater than 0.1 micrometers. It also has a strong reactivity with dopants, which can complicate the fabrication process. 2. Cobalt disilicide, COSI2. This silicide is known for its thermal stability up to 900 degrees Celsius. However, COSI2 junctions may suffer high diode leakage because of non-uniform COSI2, SI interfaces or cobalt spiking. The high silicon consumption of COSI2, 82%, may lead to problems in ultrasalar junction formation. 3. Nickel monosilicide, NISI, nickel silicide, on the other hand, is a promising candidate for future integrated circuit generations due to its line width independent low resistivity, low temperature one-step annealing, and low silicon consumption. It does not react with dopants. However, nickel silicide is thermally stable only up to a temperature of 750 degrees Celsius. Beyond this temperature, the high resistivity phase NISI2 starts to nucleate. Additionally, the stability of nickel silicides on polysilicon can be disrupted by the process of layer inversion, 
which may occur at temperature as low as 550 degrees Celsius, at which the layer reversal of the silicide and polysilicon bilayer occurs. This low temperature stability can restrict the, the use of high temperature process in subsequent Buell processes. Titanium disilicide, a popular contact material for ultra-large scale integration, ULSI, applications, is known for its high thermal stability and low resistivity. It has two types of crystalline structures, a base-centered orthorhombic C49 structure and a face-centered orthorhombic C54 structure. The C49 phase has a higher resistivity compared to the C54 phase. A C54 titanium silicide layer for contacts is generally formed by the salicide process with two-step annealing. The first step forms the C49 phase by annealing in a N2 atmosphere at a temperature range between 600 and 700 degrees Celsius. This annealing suppresses the lateral diffusion of silicon due to TIN formed on the surface and prevents the bridging of silicide between the gate and source-slash-drain, SD, regions. After the selective etching of TIN and unreacted TI, the C49 phase is transformed to the C54 phase by the second step annealing above 800 degrees Celsius. The narrow line width effect is particularly significant because it impacts the electrical properties of the interconnect. The transition from the C49 phase to the C54 phase is crucial because the C54 phase has lower resistance, which is desirable for interconnect performance. However, the decrease in the number of triple points with decreasing line width makes this transition more difficult, leading to a higher proportion of the high resistance C49 phase. This results in increased resistance for narrow line widths, which can negatively impact the performance of the interconnect. The narrow line effect of TISI2 restricts the application of this silicide to nanoscale devices. The phase transformation from C49 to C54 phases does not occur for narrower polysilicon gate lines or smaller source drain contact areas below 500 nanometers and 100 square microns, respectively. The energy barrier for the nucleation increases with decreasing the layer thickness because disc-shaped C54 nucleus in a very thin layer has a larger surface-to-volume ratio than the spherical C54 nucleus in a thick layer. Hence, the nucleation preferentially occurs at the triple points of C49 grain boundaries for silicide layers thinner than 55 nanometers, while the nucleation of the C54 phase predominantly occurs at the grain boundary of the two C49 grains for layers thicker than 100 nanometers. As a result, the transformation of C54 TISI2 is limited depending on the size of C49 TISI2 layers and the resistance of TISI2 lines increases with narrowing the line width below 1 micron. Cobalt silicide, COSI2, is a prominent material used in back end of line, BEOL, interconnects due to its advantageous properties such as low resistivity, thermal stability, and low contact resistance with silicon, making it an excellent choice for source slash drain contacts in transistors. The formation of COSI2 involves a two-step annealing process similar to C54 TISI2. The first step annealing at a low temperature provides a cobalt-rich phase silicide such as CO2SI or COSI. After the chemical selective etching of unreacted cobalt on insulators, COSI2, a low resistivity phase, is formed by the second step annealing at a high temperature. However, the use of COSI2 in Buell interconnects is not without challenges. One of the primary limitations is the rise in resistance, particularly in narrow polysilicon lines less than 50 nanometers, often attributed to voiding. Another limitation is the limited volume of silicon available for the reaction as the junctions become very shallow, leading to incomplete solicitation, increased resistance, and degraded device performance. COSI2 is also sensitive to contamination from oxygen, which can form native oxide, an insulator that can increase the resistance of the interconnect. Therefore T or tin capping layer are used to protect oxidation by ambient oxygen in the first solicitation process. The introduction of silicon germanium, SIGE, adds another layer of complexity due to its different material properties compared to pure silicon, affecting the formation and stability of COSI2. Furthermore, while COSI2 is very sensitive to native oxide, completely removing the native oxide can make diffusion control difficult, requiring a delicate balance to achieve. Lastly, the junction leakage is a considerable issue when using COSI2 for shallow source drain junctions in ULSI applications, caused by the formation of COSIX and COSI2 spikes in COSI2 slash silicon contacts. In conclusion, while COSI2 has many advantages that make it a popular choice for Buell interconnects, it also has several limitations that need to be carefully managed during the semiconductor manufacturing process. Silicide encroachment is a failure mechanism that occurs in the process of semiconductor manufacturing particularly during the formation of silicide contacts.
This phenomenon is characterized by the unwanted diffusion of silicide into the silicon sublayer, which can lead to the abnormal fast growth of silicide or pitting. The encroachment of NISI is particularly problematic due to its formation mechanism. Unlike TISI2 and COSI2, which form through silicon to metal diffusion, NISI forms through metal to silicon diffusion. This difference in formation mechanism makes NISI more susceptible to encroachment issues. Silicide encroachment occurs when the silicide formation reaction progresses abnormally fast in the SI111 direction. This can lead to the silicide encroaching into areas it should not, such as the PN junction of a transistor. When this happens, it can cause junction leakage of transistors. However, it's important to note that the exact reasons for the increased prevalence of encroachment in NISI compared to TISI2 and COSI2 are complex and still a subject of ongoing research. Factors such as the specific process conditions, the properties of the materials involved, and the design of the semiconductor device can all play a role. In terms of mitigating silicide encroachment, various strategies can be employed. These can include optimizing the process conditions to control the silicide formation reaction, using barrier layers to prevent the silicide from encroaching into unwanted areas, and designing the device structure to minimize the risk of encroachment. For example, pre-amorphization implantation, PAI, can be used to suppress silicide encroachment because PAI involves the implantation of silicon or germanium ions into the silicon substrate prior to metal deposition, which creates an amorphous layer that can inhibit metal diffusion during the solicitation process. Platinum, PT, in NIPTSI plays a crucial role in improving silicide encroachment. The addition of PT to NISI alters the reaction kinetics and phase formation during the solicitation process. This results in a more controlled and uniform silicide formation, which helps to mitigate the issue of silicide encroachment. In more detail, PT acts as a diffusion barrier, slowing down the diffusion of silicon atoms during the solicitation process. This controlled diffusion results in a more uniform and less aggressive silicide formation, reducing the risk of silicide encroachment into the junction area. Furthermore, PT also helps to raise the thermal stability, and lower the film and the contact resistance. Despite these challenges, silicide contacts remain a key component of modern semiconductor devices due to their low resistance and good thermal stability. Therefore, understanding and mitigating the risk of silicide encroachment is crucial for the continued scaling of semiconductor technology. Your passion for exploring the foundations of Buell Interconnect Episode 1, a crucial aspect of semiconductor technology, is truly inspiring. As a collective of avid learners, your interest and dedication fuel our motivation. If you've found value in this content, we kindly ask you to show your support by clicking the like button, subscribing to our channel, and enabling notifications to keep up to date with our latest insights. In our upcoming episode, we'll delve deeper into the intricacies of the copper and low K process, the electroplating, EP, process, and the future of copper interconnect. We'll dissect the process details, the roles of various chemicals and equipment, and weigh the pros and cons in the context of efficiency and quality in semiconductor manufacturing. Your continued support and enthusiasm are the driving forces behind our endeavors. Stay tuned with semi-slides as we continue to illuminate the fascinating realm of semiconductor technology. We eagerly await your company in our next episode.